Welcome to the Art of the Matter and to the celebration of All Saints Day. Our lectionary text is a great lead-in to the work of art we're going to be taking a look at in recognition of All Saints, a work of art largely based on this very text. So without further preamble, I will read from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's a wonderful vision of all the saints converging to worship the lamb who was slain and the central panel of the Ghent altarpiece, which we will be studying, is called the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. It is arguably one of the most important, if not the most important, work in all of Western art, in terms of its innovations and its influence. This is how it looks closed, with prophets and sibyls above foretelling the coming of Christ, a scene of the Annunciation right below them, with Gabriel on the left and Mary on the right, with a faraway view of the city of Ghent in between, as well as various symbolic accoutrements pertaining to the virgin birth just to the right of that view of the city. Below them, on the bottom level, are images of the donor and his wife on the right and left, and trompe l'oeil paintings of statues of John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. This kind of illusionistic painting in gray tones to mimic stone is called grisaille, and Van Eyck was a master of it, as well as being a master of every other kind of illusionistic realism. A few words about the altarpiece itself. It was begun in the mid-1420s in the city of Ghent in present-day Belgium, for the Cathedral of St. Bavo, by John Van Eyck and his brother Hubert, who subsequently died. So most of the credit for the work goes to the younger brother, Jan or Jan. This is how the altarpiece looks when it's open. As you can see, it's a polyptych composed of 12 panels. And the 12 panels you see here also have eight paintings on the other side. So 20 separate paintings in all. Why is it so important? First of all, no one had ever created anything like it before in terms of its size. It's 11 feet 6 inches by 15 feet 1 inch and in its totally innovative technique. The Vanek brothers may not have actually invented oil painting, but they were among the very first to put it to effective use and on a scale never before seen. 
Previously, painting was done either using the fresco technique, which normally introduces water-soluble pigments directly into wet plaster on a wall, the technique we saw Michelangelo using in painting the Sistine Chapel, or tempera painting, which suspends pigments in a water-soluble binding medium like egg yolk. Both these techniques produced colors that were opaque. Oil paint, however, consists of pigments suspended in oil, usually linseed oil, and it is transparent. Oil paint can be applied in glazes, one layer on top of the next, to achieve a depth of color or a transparency of color that was impossible with other forms of painting. That meant that Van Eck was able to achieve extraordinarily realistic, realistic effects when painting shimmering jewels or water, shining eyes or dewy lips, reflective mirrors and gleaming metal, effects never seen before. And almost as soon as it was completed, it became the object of pilgrimage of artists from all over Europe. Van Eck also did something else never tried before on this scale. He introduced minute detail, such as had previously only been seen in illuminated manuscripts, miniaturistic work, into this huge multi-paneled work, so that you could literally take a horse, as you see in the lower left there, and see the individual hairs of his mane, or count his eyelashes there at the bottom of the image. In that sense, Van Eck is the hinge, the fulcrum between the Middle Ages, whose work was often touched with guilt, G-I-L-T, and featuring minute details, as in a book of hours, and the art of the Renaissance, with its realism, humanism, and the innovations that oil paint made possible. Elements of both exist in his work. Erwin Panofsky, one of the 20th century's most renowned art historians, said that Van Eck's eye functioned as a microscope and a telescope at the same time. Viewers of the Ghent altarpiece, he said, are privy to God's vision of the world capturing some of the experience of him who looks down from heaven but can number the hairs on our head. And that is what is so delightful about studying the Ghent altarpiece in preparation for All Saints Day. Van Eck lets us imagine a bit of how God both sees all of creation and all of the saints, past and present, at the same time as he sees and numbers every hair on our heads. We can't begin to take in all the details that Van Eck introduced into the altarpiece. And yet the artist, in something of a godlike way, contains them in his mind, just as he contains the faraway vistas that are indicated by Van Eck's masterful use of atmospheric or aerial perspective, that unified band of sky that ties together all the panels on the bottom register of the open altarpiece. This is just a hint of the vision God has of all of us and our world now, and the vision he has or will have, depending on how you think of time and eternity, when all the saints come together to worship Christ, the Lamb who was slain, as described in today's reading. You might notice that the sky in the far left panel, the one that is said to depict the so-called just judges, is a slightly different color from the other panels. That is because this panel was stolen a number of years ago and never recovered. In fact, the Ghent altarpiece, or portions of it, has been stolen more times than any other work of art, bar none. Seven times it has been spirited away by Calvinists, that is, iconoclasts, who wanted to burn it, by Napoleon, who wanted it for the Louvre, by corrupt clergy who wanted to sell it, 
by desperate investors who wanted to ransom it for money to cover their losses. And finally, by the Nazis. In fact, if you saw the movie The Monument Men, you know that it was saved at the very last minute by those brave men, working with heroic resistance fighters and miners who located it in the salt mines of the Austrian Alps, where the Nazis had hidden it together with roughly 12,000 masterpieces of Western art. The plan was to hide the stolen works of art until the war was over, when Germany would proudly house them in its own museum of so-called Aryan art. But if the Nazis should lose the war, they had wired the mines with powerful explosives, which were set to go off with a mere press of a button should they sense that defeat was imminent. If the Germans couldn't have the art, nobody could. Just at the point when the Nazis were about to blow everything up, the monuments men and the miners managed to defuse the dynamite and thereby saved the Ghent altarpiece and all the other precious masterpieces from complete destruction. So let's take a closer look at these groups of saints who stream forward to worship the Lamb, and let's also take a look at the Lamb himself. As you can see, I've labeled the characters in each panel, beginning with Adam and Eve, who alone are naked and appear to be aware that they set in motion the cycle of sin that necessitated the sacrifice of the Lamb, who appears on the central panel, which is called the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. The large central figures at the top are the Virgin Mary on the left, God the Father in the middle, and John the Baptist on the right. We could spend hours just discussing these figures and all the inscriptions and symbols that surround them, but that will have to wait for another day. Today I call your attention to the crown, which is at the feet of God the Father, indicating that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, before whom every other king must cast his crown. It is a case study in the masterful use of the oil painting technique. Only with oil could you create the sheen of metal, to which, for added measure, Van Eck has applied a tiny bit of gold leaf, or create the transparency of rubies, emeralds, and sapphires, or the translucent quality of pearls, and the ability of all these surfaces to reflect light. Now let's take a look at our forefather, Adam, there in the upper left. Centuries ago, one of the clergy serving in St. Bavos felt that Adam and Eve were indecently exposed. So for a time, they were painted over and covered with animal skins, which have thankfully been removed in our more forgiving times. Although they still discreetly cover their naughty bits with the original fig leaves, Adam is very much of our world. Look at his foot, which actually steps out of his niche and into our space. How realistically the vein throbs in his temple. And moving in closer, you can even count his eyelashes and see the individual hairs in his beard and mustache. Because remember, the very hairs of our heads are counted. If we step away, and look at the area where his forearm crosses over his torso, we see how his veins protrude. And again, we see each hair on his arm. It's been suggested that we might just make out a faint scar on his side. If it really is there, then this is where God removed a rib of Adam's and made his new, improved version of humanity, Eve. Let's turn our attention now to the central panel of the open altarpiece, the adoration of the mystic lamb. 
I've labeled all the groups of people as well as several of the architectural monuments. It's thought that the Utrecht Cathedral at the top, just below the Holy Spirit, was added at a later date since it was not built until 1450. But the Church of St. Nicholas, just to the right, with its twin towers, was very much a part of the skyline of Ghent at that time. The other magnificent buildings that we will focus on are all meant to be parts of the New Jerusalem, which has come down from heaven. First, let's take a look at the land, toward which all the congregation turns in worship. You see that he has been pierced, and his blood flows into a sacred chalice. Beneath him is written in gold, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is surrounded by angels, who carry the instruments with which Christ was tortured before his death, the cross, the crown of thorns, the spear that pierced his side, the nails that pierced his flesh, the scourge, and the column where he was flogged. The altarpiece has been undergoing a major restoration over the last decade, and the restorers and everyone else was startled to discover how strangely human a face the lamb possessed. Once all of the overpainting, varnish, and accumulated dirt and grime of centuries had been cleared away. Below the lamb is an octagonal fountain of life from which pour rivers of living water. On it is inscribed a Latin verse from chapter 22 of Revelation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. You see how the oil paint makes the transparency of the water so evident, and the sheen of the jewels that gleam in the water surrounding the fountain. If we go back to the groups of people in the upper left, we see a group of men who are either martyrs or saints who did not have to suffer death for their faith. Above them, you see a palm tree, which might seem out of keeping with the other vegetation seen here, but this is an ideal landscape, a paradise where everything lovely blooms or bears fruit throughout time and eternity. And the palm tree was thought to evoke the idea of Jerusalem, Notice the beautiful atmospheric or aerial perspective, how it goes from green to blue to even lighter blue and then to white, and the lovely chateau nestled in the valley below. I read in a book about the altarpiece that in this group of male martyrs and saints, I would find what might be the first image of someone showing a toothy grin in all of Western art. And I looked and looked, and sure enough, here he is. I went the author of that book one better, but I'll tell you about, about that small triumph in a moment. Down in the lower right-hand pocket is a group of the original apostles who have realistically dirty feet plus popes and other clergy. Three of the popes are readily identifiable from other images of that time, Martin V, Gregory VII, and Alexander V, all magnificently arrayed and wearing their special papal hat, the papal mitre with its three tiers. Hovering above the entire scene and in a direct line, with the Father and the Lamb, which is to say Jesus, the Son, is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Far off to the left is a magnificent church, which in Van Eck's mind was intended to represent the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, surrounded by other highly detailed architecture sprung directly from his imagination. In the lower left corner, 
amongst the group of prophets and pious pagans is an indicator that Vanek was here. The exotic red hat that you see has Hebrew lettering on it. And reading from right to left, as Hebrew is written, we have Yod, Fe, Aleph, or Aleph, which would be the Hebrew equivalent of Jan Vanek's initials, JVE. Vanek frequently inserted a very discreet sign of his presence in his pictures. And this is yet another example of that. The last group on the central panel is the female martyrs and saints. Vanek hasn't made the women as individualized as he has the men. Those who bear the palm branches are martyrs. That is the traditional symbol of martyrdom. And certain saints are carrying their particular attributes. As you see in the front row, from the left, Saint Agnes with her lamb, Saint Barbara with her tower, Saint Dorothy with her bowl of fruit, and so on. Far more interesting is the minutely observed architecture above them. And the incredibly detailed plant life on the right. It is said that every plant painted in the altarpiece can be and has been accurately identified by botanists, so lifelike was Vanek's work. Here we have a Madonna lily, and irises, blue at the top, columbine down below, that's the other blue, and wild roses. And those of you who are avid gardeners can probably identify every plant in this close-up of the Madonna lily. We'll finish up with the three lower side panels that also include groups that are coming forward to worship the Lamb. I won't include the just judges on the far left, since this is a modern copy of what scholars think the original looked like. All the rest are genuine. These panels show the Knights of Christ, the Holy Hermits, and the Holy Pilgrims. So here we have the Knights of Christ, each bearing the flag of a particular medieval chivalric order. From left to right, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, the Knights of St. George, uh, from which the English flag is derived, the cross on a white field, and the Order of St. Sebastian. Taking a look at the armor of the two knights, you can see how brilliantly Van Eck used oil paint's ability to depict reflection. Here you see the outline of buildings reflected in the metal. And here you see how the scalloped green edge of the knight's sleeve is reflected in the metal, as well as the refracted red line of the red flagpole that he's holding. Such minute attention to detail, it's absolutely astonishing. The next one of the three side panels is that of the holy hermits. And behind them, you see Mary Magdalene and another anonymous maiden. Mary Magdalene is recognizable by her attribute of the jar of ointment with which she anointed Christ. Don't you just love the way that Van Eck manages to give absolutely original features and faces to each person? They're so different and so very particular. At last, we come to the Holy Pilgrims, led by St. Christopher, the patron saint of pilgrims, who was said to be extremely tall, like a giant. Behind him is someone who has made the pilgrimage to Compostela, to the shrine of St. James. He is identified by the scallop shell, which those who have made the pilgrimage to the church of Santiago de Compostela have the right to wear. But behind him is my own personal discovery. After spending hours combing over the 100 billion pixel photographs 
that now exist on the wonderful website called Closer to Van Eck, Rediscovering the Ghent Altarpiece, which was made possible by the Getty Foundation. This is the web link to that site, and I encourage you to go there and explore the Ghent Altarpiece on your own. But here is my little discovery. Someone who appears to be a female and who sports an even toothier grin than the one on the young man you saw earlier. And she even has a dimple. I can't tell you how excited I was to pick her out of the crowd of pilgrims. The first female toothy grin in all of Western art with a dimple. Take that, all you professional male art historians. Who says I don't lead an exciting life? So I leave you with Jan Van Eck's great masterpiece and its magnificent central panel showing the adoration of the mystic lamb. I hope we'll all be part of that crowd of worshiping saints one day, joining all those who have gone before us and whose lives we celebrate today, All Saints Day. It'll take me a few weeks to get back to you with my next edition of The Art of the Matter because my main desktop computer died last weekend, and for the moment I'm left limping along with my laptop. I hope to acquire a new computer soon, and certainly in time for Advent, which has such exquisite artwork that I'd love to share with you. In the meantime, be well, be safe, be blessed, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>